Leviticus chapter 24. I won't, uh, I won't get you to stand this morning. We'll just step straight into a word of prayer and then uh, I'll uh, work through this passage. We'll look through a rather large portion at some stage this morning. So um, we'll just pray that the Lord would help us and uh, bless this time. And uh, we'll uh, step into the, the scriptures this morning. Agustine, is it all right if you pray, please, brother? Can I ask you to do that? Lord, uh, Father, we come to the presence. Give thanks, Lord, for this morning, Lord, for the people present, for those that have not been able to come, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you bless them as well, Lord, and you bring them safe at uh, some point. Lord, I uh, pray also for um, the word, Lord, for um, that is going to be given today, Lord, that it might be your Holy Spirit opening our ears, Lord, and our understanding, Lord, that we can be um, humble enough, Lord, to do your will and know what we think it is your will. Um, dear Father, I also pray for Pastor Lord, and give him wisdom in the presence of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All righty, Leviticus chapter 24, and the Bible says that the Lord spake unto Moses saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually, without the veil of the testimony, in the tabernacle of the congregation, shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlesticks before the Lord continually. Verse 5, And thou shalt take fine flour, and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put fr pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. We have here the, the, uh, the, the establishment of the tabernacle and the giving of the law of how it's to be run and, and getting down to the specifics of, of what must be done. And if you're not familiar with the tabernacle, this tent that was in the wilderness, there was in the midst of that tent a, a, a candlestick. And that candlestick wasn't a waxen candlestick that we might think of today, but oil candles. And that oil was burnt for light before the Lord. And so the simple instruction is given. Command the children of Israel that they bring under the pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. In the service of the Lord, they had to make sure that candle didn't go out. It was continually burned. There was always light in there. Then, step down to verse 5. Thou shalt take fine flour. Bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And it talks about the baking of these cakes. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. And so there were these loaves to be baked out of, out of flour, and frankincense to be put on top of them. And this was done, to be done each week. It's in this tent. There was this table of shoe bread and that bread was to be put out there. And these things all are just pictures. You know the old saying, a picture speaks a thousand words? The candle was the light of God, uh, the, the, the light of the gospel, the light of Christ. It was a representation of the word of God. as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The shoe bread being a picture of Christ and the, the, the sacrifice and the, He was the bread of life and God's provision and God's enabling of us that in Him we live and move and have our being. You go in the power of God as you go. 
I don't know what you had for breakfast, but that's what's keeping you going this morning. Maybe you had a dingo's breakfast, a drink of water and a look around. That's what you're going in the power of this morning. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You need to go in the power of Christ. That's the power that you're going in. That's, that's your strength. That is your strength. But there's some practicalities that aren't spelled out here. There in the very beginning, it's the, the, on this olive oil, it states this. I'm getting dizzy because I keep on coming back. I might carry this with me. <laughs> Command the children of Israel that they bring under the pure oil, olive beaten for the light. Olive oil that was pure, that was beaten out of the olives that it might be burnt in the tabernacle of the Lord for light. Do you know what that means? That means that a priest had to get that oil and pour it into those candles and keep them topped up so that that flame wouldn't go out, right? So that means there had to be a stockpile of oil somewhere that he could get that oil and put it in. Well, that means somebody had to bring the oil to that stockpile where the priest knew where to get it. And he could go there and get it. And he had to make sure that there was always oil in there so that the priest could do what he needed to do with the light. Well, that meant that somebody had to go to an olive farmer and make up some supply contract or some provision to make sure that that farmer was able to provide him oil. Now get this also, this was given as they were wandering in the wilderness. So there... The contract perhaps wasn't with a farmer, but with someone harvesting from wild olives as they wandered. But nonetheless, there had to be a supply of oil. And so someone went out and said, you make sure you bring me oil so that I can bring it to the priest, so that the priest can put it in the candle, so the candle can burn before the Lord. Well, that meant somebody had to go and find the trees and pick the olives. And I skipped a bit. Maybe it's the same fella. For the sake of a story, we'll just keep it the same fella. That he had to find the tree and he had to pick the olives that he could then beat the oil out of so that he could supply the contract, so that he could get it to the supplier that could get it to the priest so that the candle of the Lord might be burning continually. And so old mate got up in the morning and he went wandering around out in the wilderness looking for some olive trees so that he might pick some olives. And I've no doubt as he came across those olive trees, he came across some paper wasps that were hiding in there. He came across some snakes that were in his way as he wandered looking. He came across all the toils and the trials and the troubles that come upon us in our daily life. But he had to get that oil so that it could go and get beaten out, so that it could be provided to the supplier, so that he could fill up the IBC that was outside the temple and outside the tabernacle or whatever it was that was there, that the priest might go out there and pick it up, that he might keep the candles burning. And once all that was done, the priest had to bake some cakes out of flour which means he needed to have a supply of flour, which means he had to find someone that could supply him with flour, which means someone had to plant some wheat or some grain crops. Or get this, someone had to harvest from wild grain whilst they're wandering in the wilderness so they could keep that supply up. So that, that grain could be ground to flour so that it might be turned into bread. That it might be baked before the Lord and sat out in front of him. And so someone had to plough and someone had to harvest and someone had to swing a, a, a sickle. And if someone's swinging a sickle, then someone had to keep it sharp. 
And long before someone kept it sharp, someone had to make that sickle. And so there was a blacksmith somewhere beating out sickles so that someone could harvest some grain so that that grain could be turned into bread so that it could be put into the tabernacle to be made before the Lord. And then that bread had to have frankincense put on it. Frankincense is sap out of a... I can't pronounce it. It's not a frankincense tree. You'd think it was, but it's not. <laughs> it sounds like Botswana, but it's not Botswana. I can't remember the name. And you can tap sap out of these trees comfortably three or four times a year. You can stretch it out to 12 times a year. So someone had to go around and look for some wild frankincense trees, which do grow wild in that part of the world. And they had to tap that sap out, cuts in there like you would in a rubber tree, that it might bleed out, that that sap would dry, that they could harvest it, that they could keep the supply for the frankincense that might be supplied for the tabernacle so that the work of God could be done. Now you know, you know someone got cut doing that work. You know somebody got themselves a blister doing that work. You know somebody got bitten by a snake when they were out there doing that work. Someone got stung by a wasp. Someone got out of bed and when they didn't feel like it and went out there to work and labour to bring it in that the work of God might be done. So Leviticus chapter 24 just says, make sure this is done in the tabernacle. And in verse 10, the sons of Ar and the sons of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to make up what they were fighting about. I don't want to just sort of pull some imaginary things from from our brain and go, well, this is what it was all about. But I went through all of that industry just to point out some things that the the camp of Israel wasn't getting up in the morning and cooking a coffee on their Coleman stove and watching the surroundings, waiting for the Lord to move them on like they're on a camping trip. That was their life. There was mouths to feed. There was contracts to fill. There was supply that was needed. There was all these things that were required for life to continue. And in the midst of it, the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp and the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. I wonder if it was while he was gathering frankincense. I wonder if it was over... Over, over the labour that they were going about. Generally speaking, you don't have a fight about nothing. You have a fight about something. Something had stirred these fellows up. Now, the Bible, the Bible doesn't say it was over frankincense or over, over oil or over wheat. I just go there because the Lord said, make sure these things are supplied. And then the Lord goes, oh, and I want to tell you about a fight that happened in the camp of Israel. And I go, Okay. We've just gone from that to this. Perhaps there's no connection, but all of a sudden my mind is on that and now it's on this fight. And he blasphemes the Lord. In the name of the Lord, and he cursed, and they brought him unto Moses. And his, no his mother's name was... Shilamith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan, and they put him in ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed them 
And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that cursed without the camp, and let all the, that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin. And he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him, as well the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall he be put to death. Let me just stop preaching for a second and just give you a bit of a testimony of my own, my own weeks from time to time. As a pastor, there's certain things that are my, uh, a requirement of me. One of the most obvious, of course, is to preach of a Sunday. And so a part of my task is preparation for that, to find some time to get in the Word of God, to be able to study it out, that I might be able to feed the flock over which the Lord has made me an overseer. And I need to study myself, a study in that, to be able to do that. I need to study the Word of God that I might rightly divide it so that I don't teach you wrong. Then in Acts 6, I believe it is, I understand and learn that I need to be careful that I can give myself continually to the Word of God and prayer. That a part of my responsibility is to be in prayer for the flock that God has given me to be seeking the Lord about that. I go to Timothy and Titus and I see that a part of the requirement on a pastor is to set in order the things that are wanting. And it's not, yes, it's the things that are wanting in this sort of environment, but it's the things that are wanting in our church. And our church isn't this hall on this Sunday morning. Our church is you. And it's my task to be observant of the things that are wanting in your life and be used of God to help set that in order. To varying degrees. Some through imploring, some through pleading, some through teaching more perfectly the Word of God, some through open rebuke. Now, I've spliced conveyor belts for a living. I've chased cows for a living. I've, I've watched mud go past on conveyor belts for a living. Sorting out rocks for a living. And do you know what? You can have a filthy attitude and still join two pieces of rubber together really, really well. In fact, when you've got a bad attitude, a crowbar and a hole to dig is a pretty good combination. Because you can take out that bad attitude on a lump of dirt that you're supposed to turn into a hole. But it's real hard, really, really hard to study the Word of God with a filthy attitude. And it might be, it might be easy to set some things in order with a filthy attitude, but it's not advisable. There's all these things where all of a sudden, and you know what I've been guilty of going? I've been guilty of going, Lord, I'd, I'd like to be just splicing conveyor belts again because then I wouldn't have to be in a good frame of mind every single day. Because, Lord, I can cut rubber while the flesh is raining. Have you ever had that attitude? Have you ever, have you ever put money in your bank through the toil of your hands and your heart is not after God? I have. And all of a sudden, pastor in a church, I've, it's, become, it's become obvious to me that Look, sometimes I go and mow the lawn instead of studying because that's about where my attitude's at. I'll cut some grass. 
because I can't pray right now. I can't make that phone call right now. I can't get in the Word of God right now. Give me a lawnmower. (laughs) I wonder if I could go and harvest frankincense that was to be burnt in the tabernacle and swing that axe and cut that tree and bleed that sap that's to be burnt as light before the Lord while I cursed my brother. I wonder if that frankincense would be acceptable under the Lord when it was harvested with such wicked hands. I wonder if I could plough that paddock and sow that wheat in bitterness against my family in wanton sin and expect that that bread that has been sowed by my wicked hands might be acceptable in the tabernacle as an offering unto the Lord. I wonder if I could beat the oil out of those olive trees whilst my mind wandered to every vile thought that I might choose not to bring it into obedience on. I wonder if I could get up in the morning and go, Lord, I'm not sorting out my issues with you today. I'm just going to go dig a hole in disobedience and rebellion, but that hole is going to get dug all the same. And for years, even as a pastor, I kidded myself that I could serve the Lord splicing conveyor belts with a bad attitude and it's still acceptable under him. I go to Leviticus 24 and here's a man that gets in a fight with somebody and in the midst of the fight he blasphemes the name of God and he curses God and he's put to death for it. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't in the tabernacle. He wasn't in some holy place. He was the son of an Egyptian that married an Israelitish woman was raised up in a home where there was just perhaps a bit of division about how life should be lived. Let me ask you, what areas of your life don't you need to be holy in? Some of you are electricians. Some of you are engineers. You know the maths works whether you're in sin or in righteousness. Oxyacetylene torch doesn't care whether you've been reading your Bible every morning or watching filth from Hollywood. It doesn't. That that oxyacetylene torch is going to work just the same. That hole is going to get dug just the same. But where are we before the Lord? Go with me to Romans. Step over into the New Testament. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want Romans. I want Ephesians. Ephesians. Once you found Romans, just mark your place. Go back there. Read it some other time. It's a good book. And uh, go to Ephesians. In chapter 6, Ephesians 6. The Bible says, Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Children, obey your parents. And ye fathers, in verse 4, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleases but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With good will doing service 
as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You've come to church this morning and perhaps you've given offering. Perhaps you've taken money from your bank account and placed it before the Lord. Can I borrow your Bible just momentarily? Don't take any of this personally. Perhaps you've stood up here and read a Bible passage. And I'm not singling Reg out, I'm singling out the example. Perhaps you've chosen that passage a couple of weeks ago and asked that it might be finished off this morning because that's what happened, right? Perhaps you've gathered here and you've lifted up your voice in song and you've been singing and we sang well this morning. We sang well. Breakfast was helpful. Whatever it was you were hearing the power of this morning, it was a good song. And maybe it's because you were here in Christ and He was your strength to sing. But you've done these things this morning because something has enabled you to do that. I mean, just some practical things, like food in the fridge so that you're not laying dying in a bed of hunger. You're here with energy to do something for the Lord. How is it that you put that food in the fridge? How is it that you partook of it? Children, honour your parents, obey your father and mother. You have these things, you read your Bible. Oh, sorry, Mike. You take of your bank account and you put it in an offering to a missionary over in East Timor. You pay it in tithe that the work of the Lord might continue in the local church. And I, I have said, Lord, would to God that I was spliced in a conveyor belt so I could have a filthy attitude every now and then and it not hinder my work as if my work was before men and not before God. And it takes me to have to be backed into a corner for about 15 years of pastor in a church where every ounce of work I have to do is of a spiritual nature you know what? Every now and then the insurance looks good because I figure I can, I can fill out insurance forms with a bad attitude. <laughs> not if it's for the Lord. So what is it that you're doing that's not for the Lord? What aspect of your life needs not be consecrated and set apart before God? Am I requiring sinlessness of you? No, just... Acknowledgement of your sin, confession and repentance. It's what we've got to walk in. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we're cleansed of all unrighteousness, then I might be able to serve God. So you know what? Let me just help you here real brief. It doesn't matter what sin you walked in five minutes ago as to whether you're standing clean for the service of God, it matters what repentance and confession before God you walked in five minutes ago. Now, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But nonetheless, how is your cleanliness before God? How is it that you go to work? How is it that you tidy the house? How is it that you teach the kids? You say, oh, well, uh, and look, some of us are in roles where our spiritual demeanor really affects our immediate work, right? And sometimes practically. You know, Josh and Steve probably build their best fences when they're attentive and diligent 
and have a, have a care factor that actually this is done for the honour of, uh, honor of the Lord, so I better make it deep, I better make it straight, I better make it strong. Because when it's... You know, you know, here's the thing about fencing. I know a little bit about fencing. Once you put the dirt back on top, you can't tell how deep the hole is for a couple of years. And you know those fences that are doing this after a couple of years, that tells you how deep the hole is or how solid the ground is. And if the ground is soft, that hole better be deep or that concrete better be wide because that's the only thing that it's got to hold it straight. And if you're doing it before the eyes of man, well then, when the, get, when the digging gets a bit hard, just start filling in again. But when you're doing it before the eyes of God, well, hang on, this matters. When you're standing before a classroom, when you're sitting around a home table teaching your kids, when you're doing those things, I mean, we don't have a doctor here, but I imagine when you're sitting across a doctor's desk, I'd like that doctor to be in tune with the Lord. I'd like him to have a care factor about giving account to God. So some things we do where we might be very mindful of the fact that, hey, my walk with God matters as I do this task. But if you're like me, then there's plenty of times where you've done 1 plus 1 equals 2 in your, ma in your work and you've thought nothing about your standing before God. And then this has happened. And if I just do it with money but apply it to every aspect of your life, you go to work and God's been dealing with you about some sin in your life. You've cursed and blasphemed God. You've partaken of that which is, is forbidden. You've walked in iniquity. And in that iniquity, you go out into the workforce and you, you earn a dollar in your bank and you go, you know what? Some of that dollar's for God. And it's a defiled dollar. It's a dollar that was earned through a filthy attitude. And so then all of a sudden, you can go, oh, you know what? My dollar went to a missionary on a mission field and that missionary is over there supporting the work of God off a dirty dollar from your dirty attitude. And you go, but that doesn't matter. You know, I'm a partaker of that ministry. And, and I'm putting food on the table that's come from the money you pay me as a pastor that's all of a sudden a dirty dollar. Because of the lack of holiness and the lack of grace and the lack of forgiveness and the lack of confession that you're working in your life in. And we go, but that doesn't matter. Well, if it doesn't matter, why is there a dead Egyptian in Leviticus 24? It wasn't in the service of God that he cursed. It was out there in the camp. It wasn't in the temple. He wasn't burning oil. He wasn't making bread for God. And you go, you know what? I'm going to make sure that what I teach my Sunday school class is good and right and sound before the high eyes of God. That it's holy and pure. I look for my, I look for my pictures that I'm going to use as illustrations and I'm going to make sure they represent a godly standard of living. You know, you, Sunday, if you don't know it, Sunday school teachers get on Google and they look for colouring in pictures for your children to colour in in a Sunday school class. And aren't you grateful that when they find those pictures to colour in and they find a picture of somebody that your three-year-old is going to colour in to remind them about the Good Samaritan, that the, the innkeeper that they choose to pick, and I guarantee you they do have to do this, they've sifted through a bunch of pictures and they go, you know what, that looks like a good picture of an innkeeper. 
I'll leave the colouring in pictures where their skirts are this long and their midriffs and their belly button rings and their piercings and their tattoos and they go, no, I won't use that for my Sunday school class picture because that's not really representing godliness. I'm glad they do that. But is that right? If they choose those pictures, and I use this illustration because it's not an issue with any of our Sunday school teachers, but they pick those pictures because that's a godly representation. They pick something that shows some, some godliness about what the Good Samaritan probably looked like. And all week, they've gone all week without a belly button ring. And they've gone all week with clothes that represent some modesty and some godliness before the world. And they've gone all week with making sure that their voice and their language and their words are seasoned with grace. And where they've stumbled and fallen, they've gone back and said, Lord, I've, I, I, I stumbled, I walked in sin, will you forgive me that I might walk in grace? That they can stand up and teach a Sunday school class, not just with some godly artwork, but off the back of a godly life. And that's the way it ought to be. But not just for Sunday school teachers. Are you okay with me going to the pub on Thursday night and having a sesh? Then standing up here and preaching on Sunday morning? I hope you're not alright with that. But if it's not right for my life, there's not some higher standard expected of me. We're all children of God. And you know what? I don't bother teaching Phoebe that she shouldn't be going down the pub. That lesson's coming. But I do teach Abby and Lily that that's not a place they need to be. And so there's, there's not a different requirement... There's just, there's just a different lesson at different necessary ages, right? But we get in the household of God and go, oh, the preacher, he needs to be here. The deacon, they need to be there. Oh, the deacon's wife, she needs to be here. But I'm neither of those things, so... Tannum pub, here I come. What's on telly? Oh, there's some nakedness. But that's all right, I'm not preaching this weekend. Oh, there's some foul language, but that's all right. I'm not swearing. Children, obey your parents in fear of the Lord. Mum and Dad aren't watching. Dad wouldn't let me play this. Dad wouldn't let me watch this. But they're not watching. Then you get asked to lead the kids' Sunday school class or records for the, the preaching or to sing this song with the congregation. And you get up this morning and you make sure you look like a Christian. And you make sure you sing and sound like a Christian. But during the week, you were out in the camp cursing and blaspheming God and thinking that that is okay because it wasn't in the temple, it wasn't in the tabernacle. And we forget that everything we do goes into the temple and goes into the tabernacle, goes into the service of God. We, part, we, we, we categorize our lives and let me ask you something. Let me ask you, is every aspect of your vocabulary. You know what your vocabulary is, right? The words that are acceptable to you and not, right? Don't answer it, because I don't want you to embarrass yourself in front of everyone if it's a bad answer, all right? But let me ask you, do you use your whole vocabulary in this place, or is there an element of your vocabulary that's not acceptable in the house of God? Do you get the point of my question? If it's not acceptable in the house of God... 
Sam's like, oh no. There's a TV up there. You know what you'll put on a TV screen. You know what you go, this is acceptable for me to watch and this is not acceptable for me to watch. I'm not talking about their standard. I'm talking about your standard when it's just you and God. And I don't want you to answer the question, but let me ask it. Are you comfortable turning that TV screen on and playing before the whole congregation here everything that is acceptable in your standard or are there things that you go, you know what, that's not right in church. That's not right before God. Well, if it's not right before God when nobody's around watching, what makes it right when everybody's around watching? No. Let's do that the other way around. But we compartmentalise. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that God requires or... How do I word that? God desires a perfect life for you. He desires sinlessness in you. But he doesn't anticipate it to be the case. He knows you're going to fall. That's why there's grace and forgiveness. But do you walk in grace and forgiveness? Or do you walk in compartmentalised sections? This is work, and so what's acceptable at work... That's how I am there. Now, that's not acceptable at home, and that's not acceptable in, in church, and that's not acceptable like art. Ah. And, and so you compartmentalize. If we can compartmentalize our lives, why is there a dead Egyptian in Leviticus 24? He curses and blasphemes. And they say, Lord, what do we do? They say, put him up in ward that we might find the mind of God in this matter. And they didn't have it, but they got it right. We have Ephesians, 5, Ephesians 6. We have Ephesians 6. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Is your heart single under Christ? I like picking on visitors. I'm Luke. You know this fella, so I'm really going to pick on him rather than on you. You see how he's doing this morning, right? You hear how he's talking. You see how he's rolling. Now, don't answer the question, all right? We don't want to embarrass either one of you. But when you have a mate in church, does he see you the same? Does you just knock on the same way you always knock? Or does he see that, oh, he runs different today than he did yesterday? And you were running with him yesterday, so you know it's not your company if he's changed. It's something else. And I'm not trying to single out these young people. I'll get to some of you old guys in a minute as well. Your marriage is nice and sweet of a Sunday morning. Your conduct's all godly. Oh, you know your Bible. When you ask to pray, you'll pray comfy. Now, don't get me wrong. Look, I, just, I, I want to bear testimony in this. I'm struggling in my prayer life. If, if you've heard me ask for prayer of a Wednesday night in the last six months, you've probably heard me regularly say, pray for me about my prayer life because I'm struggling in that area. I'm just having a, it's just a hard slog for me right now. Right, so I'm not, I'm not standing up here saying everything's got to be perfect all the time. But you asked me to pray this morning... And I can wax eloquent in prayer and you'll go, what a sorry Christian he is. No, I don't know what you'll do. But we can make it look good. But how was your prayer on your own this week? Yeah? How was your prayer time there? Stand up and read a Bible verse in front of the church. 
Turns out it's the first time he's opened up his Bible all week. It's probably not. <laughs> yeah? I tell you what the Lord got on me about. Reading my Bible for preaching. Lord wore me out about that a few years back. I was only picking up my Bible to get ready for preaching. And all of my Bible reading. Now there was plenty of it. It was every day. But every day the reason I was reading my Bible was to give you something instead of getting something from God. Instead of me knowing Him and being close to Him. And I stand up here and someone pats me on the back and say, thank you for that sermon, brother. It was such a blessing. And there's not one time that week where I've picked it up for me to say, Lord, what do you have for me? Because I couldn't be bothered. Because I start focusing on the service instead of on the King. Because I start doing all these things that aren't about Christ and in singleness of heart, honouring Him, but all these things that I might receive something of. And so Ephesians 6 gives us the answer about what should happen with this Egyptian. That our conduct should not be with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. As the servants of Christ, you to do His will from the heart. So, can't use tomorrow, it's a public holiday. Tuesday, you're going to get up, you're going to go to work. And you're going to be a servant of the Port Authority or a servant of Rio Tinto or a servant of Coles or a servant of Woolworths or a servant of the local doctor's surgery or a servant of an accountant somewhere or a servant of... a. a a glasses shop or I'm just looking around trying to find some servants and as you land there let me tell you what your task is your task is not to do the will of Rio Tinto that's not why you're there your task is not to do the will of the Port Authority or to do the will of your boss your task is to do the will of God. And you, in today's day and age in business, you will be pressed on that. The company, if you're in a contracting company, the company will say, just book down a few more hours so we can charge a bit extra. And you'll have to go, hang on, am I here to do the will of God or the will of the company? Your boss will say, now look, we've got to focus this month and I just want you to upsell every customer that comes in. It doesn't matter whether they need it or not. Just make sure they leave here buying more than they need it. Convince them. And you justify it out in your mind about how you're being a good salesman, but it comes down to are you going to do the will of God or the will of man with singleness of heart doing the will of God. If you're Christ's, then you're not just Christ's on Sunday morning. You don't raise your kids how you want. You are to raise your kids how God wants. And I guarantee you this, given your wicked, sinful, fallen nature, every now and then, God is going to ask you to do something as a parent that you actually don't want to do. You would actually just let them get away with that. You would actually not correct that because if you correct that, then you better correct this. I tell you what, if you're a parent, that'll get you behind the woodshed plenty of times with God. You just tear strips off your kid about some foul behavior in them and God says, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. I'm marking that down. I'm marking that down. You finish there? Come on, your turn. And he just regurgitates it back at you. Go, what he did to you, what she did to you, is what you do to me. Here, 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 and here. And so the next time you go, you know what? Have at it, honey. I'm not calling you on that one because then God's going to call me. And you better decide whether you're going to do the will of God or the will of man. Not here. 
Out there. So the question was asked, what, what's to be done with this Ethiopian? He's supposed to do the will of God. He's supposed to do it from the heart. Now that's a big call. Now I pick up my Bible and I study out a sermon. And there's some principles in God's Word about how we're to study your Bible. I'm not just to take it and pick whichever verse I want and find some other passages that are going to back up my beliefs and preach that to you. I need to rightly divide the Word of God, right? I need to do it God's way, but from the heart. Is my heart to find God's way, to do it God's way? We go, I can really see that. I can really see that. And so then I used to go to work and I'd pick up a nice big sharp knife and I'd be starting to cut rubber out. And I forget. I forget that I'd be cutting rubber and fellas would be going, come on, just hack it out and get it done. And I'd be like, no, we need to do this properly. The customer's expecting a good job. Or we, can't, we, we, can't, we, we contaminate the splice, we contaminate the joint or something, in which case you've got to pull it all apart, wash it all down, start it all over again. And everyone wants to go, no, that's another five hours' work. Just cover it up. And you can relate to that somewhere in your line of work. And is it the will of God or the will of man from the heart? What are you going to do? Where's your heart in this? Is it after God? And it was found that that Ethiopian wasn't doing the will of God from the heart. And he cursed and he blasphemed the holy name of God and he was to be put to death. What's the judgment against you last week? Old Testament, did you blaspheme? Did you curse the holy name of God? Did you rip someone off? You know what God says in his abomination? Diverse weights and diverse measures. If you're in sales, selling a kilo of product, to one company for five dollars and selling it to another company for fifty dollars because they got more money is an abomination to God. And if you're in sales, the world does that all the time. And you're going to have to face that and deal with that. I understand contract agreements and I understand supply and you give a better price because they're buying lots of product. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just cold, black and white, they've got more money so I'll charge them more. It's an abomination under the law. Put yourself up in ward for a while and seek the mind of the Lord on the matter and you'll find worthy of death. Worthy of death. Do you know what it means when you're worthy of death? That means you need Calvary. You need Christ. You need somebody who has died in your place. It's not that there's not a death penalty for sin anymore. It's that the death penalty is paid. You weigh it up and go, you know what? That's an, I've, just, I've, I've walked in disobedience to God and I'd be like that Ethiopian, where, that Egyptian, where I'd be worthy of death. I need to go to Christ. I need to plead the cross. I need to get on my knees before God and say, God, I've done wickedly here. And then next week, you're going to be faced with a decision. Do you do the same thing that God called you on last week and use the blood of Christ and tread it underfoot so that you don't have to cause offence? Or do you start walking righteous before the eyes of God and going, I'm going to change. I'm going to make a difference. Those things that I've just been going to forgiveness for over and over and over and over again, I'm going to determine in my life that I'm not going to have to go back to forg for forgiveness on that matter anymore. That when it comes next time around, I'm going to have to decide not do I keep them happy or do I keep me happy. I'm going to have to decide do I walk 
over the blood of Christ, using it as the means whereby I can do this and not have to die. Or am I going to walk under the blood of Christ and go, because of His blood, I'll not do that anymore. I'll not walk in that sin anymore. What is it you've been doing? How's your walk with the Lord? You know what I need to do? You know what I need to stop doing? I need to stop going, Lord, it would be easier if I was splicing belts because then I wouldn't have to have such a disciplined life before you. I'd just be able to relax and have a bad attitude when I want to every now and then. As if that's some excusable thing. And I need to see that every aspect of what I do, whether I'm mowing the lawn or whether I'm preaching or preparing, or praying, that it needs to be with singleness of heart as under the Lord. And if it's not, then I'm out of line. I'm in sin. It's not excusable. It's not okay. There's no time, but does anyone, and you do, does anyone know what the close of this chapter is in Ephesians about the armour of God the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness have a, have a look through that armour I guarantee you if God's called you on something this morning about some sin you've been walking in have a look at that armour and you go you know what the breastplate of righteousness would fix me of that if I actually walked in righteousness you know what a belt of truth would fix me in that Oh, my feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace that I was taking the gospel with me everywhere I go. That would fix me. That's what I need. You have a look at that armour, you'll probably find a piece of armour that deals with whatever it is that God's calling you on this morning. Here's your answer about walking righteously before the Lord. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this morning. And my Lord... As I consider these passages and consider these verses, Lord, I I stand guilty. I don't stand up here this morning, Lord, as a preacher that is, is not guilty of these things. I stand guilty. But Lord, I look to stand in the blood of Christ, forgiven. I thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice. And I pray, dear Lord, that we wouldn't bury our heads in the sand. We wouldn't turn our heads away from the the truth of who we are and how we go about in our business. That we'd be mindful, Lord, that everything we do flows back to the tabernacle in heaven. That throne of grace, everything goes back to you, Lord. And that we might do it with singleness of heart as under the Lord. Doing the will of God from the heart. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would work in each and every one of us. And Lord, if there's, a, if there's someone here this morning that does not know you, I pray, Lord, they'd see that everything they do is outside of the blood and that their death is what will be held on them for the payment of sin. And they need to run to Calvary and run to Jesus and lay a hold of your death, Lord, for the payment of their sin. I pray, Lord, that that which we began in at the cross of Calvary, we'd continue our walk there. That you'd bring us back often, seeking your forgiveness, as many say, keeping short accounts with God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. Don't feel like you need to rush off. You're welcome to stay in the hall and fellowship.